Hi everyone, welcome to the Taurus Data Science Podcast. I'm your host, YK Sugi, and today I have an interview with Vladimir Iglovikov. He's a Kaggle Grandmaster, and he's currently a senior computer vision engineer at Lyft. In this interview, we talked about his journey as a data scientist uh, through his first data science job, uh, various Kaggle competitions that he did, and eventually becoming a computer vision engineer at Lyft. And first, I asked him to introduce himself. Uh, so my name is Vladimir. Ten years ago, I came to the United States to the graduate school to UC Davis to study physics. Uh, then I got my PhD there, and at the end, I had really like a question: Where should I go? Stay in academia or move to industry? UC Davis located one hour away from Silicon Valley, and plenty of my friends got their data science and software engineering jobs here. And I decided that in terms of new knowledge, in terms of money in terms of doing something new in my life. Silicon Valley looks like a good place to be. So I got my first job in startup called Bidgely. It was in Sunnyvale and I didn't like Sunnyvale. Sunnyvale is empty and it's not type of the Silicon Valley that I imagined, like no one on the streets and kind of like So after eight months there, I switched jobs and I moved to San Francisco, which is definitely probably the best place to be in Silicon Valley. It has like its own limitations, maybe a bit dirty here and there, but it's what you expect when you come here. You know, life is boiling, big tech companies, meetups, conferences, startups. In every Starbucks, you see like people on their laptops trying to build their own company or something is happening. It's like cool, like cool drive, and I enjoyed it. It was correct decision moving to San Francisco. But my second company was called Trocord. It was a debt collection agency, and I had cool jobs, this team was strong and product was decent, but at the same time, I didn't want to stay there that long. After physics background, you know, collecting debts using machine learning didn't look as exciting. So after after true accord, I moved to Lyft to work on deep learning, computer and vision related jobs. And I explained this blog post, you know, my journey for this position. It, it was slightly challenging, but still kind of like cool work. So, and for the last two and a half years, I work here. I see. Uh, so before what you explained in your article, how did you switch from physics to your machine learning setup jobs? So um, at the time when I was doing this, life could like probably significantly easier and maybe harder in some sense. So machine learning is a relatively new field in the industrial setting. Of course, people were using logistical linear regression for like many decades. But in such a scale as we have it right now, where there are special positions like research scientists or machine learning engineers or data scientists, it's a relatively new story. So no one knows how to hire. And this adds a lot of lottery to it. So it was relatively challenging for me for moving from physics to data science. In one interview, you asked about like MapReduce and Hadoop and Spark. On second interviews, you asked about you know, how to derive SVM. Third interview, you ask about some intricacies of the banking business and all this knowledge when you came from academia was really foreign to me. So that's why it was a lot of chance when I moved from academia to industry. Still kind of worked, especially because picking up machine learning to the level where you can operate with this and solve some problems and bring value to the companies, plus understanding math of it after physics background was extremely easy. So basically moving from machine learning to physics may be challenging, moving from physics to machine learning relatively easy. And that's why many of my friends and overall, like I, I see the strength, people in physics and academia, they compare their salaries and projects that they have in their future as a postdocs with what Google, Facebook, Lyft, Uber can provide to them and yeah, flows pretty big. I see. So I guess you you basically learned everything in machine learning on your own then? Uh, definitely, yes. So I, I took a couple classes on Coursera, but it doesn't lead anywhere. Even now, I'm a bit skeptical about some classes in universities about machine learning. The discipline is very applied. For every rule, there is exception. For every exception, there is another exception. Things that work on one data set may not work on another. And you need to develop some deep intuition to develop practical experience. So my experience in machine learning came, of course, I was reading a lot of papers and books and blog posts. At the same time, I aggressively participated in Kaggle competitions where I tried to bridge the gap between data sets that Kaggle provided and metrics that were 
they are de defined there versus theoretical knowledge that they were getting from papers. And that was relatively painful because you read some paper, you take like what is claimed state of their result, you train some model, you apply this, and you're at the bottom of the leaderboard at Kaggle because it's not state of the art and because community is smart or maybe data set is different and things like this. So I was participating, I don't know, more than 70 competitions. Finally, after a few years, I got title of Kaggle Grandmaster, which again, as a title, opened some doors for me in terms of career opportunities and of course some public speaking conferences and this type of activities. So yeah, basically my machine learning knowledge, it was yeah, purely self-education. And it's hard for me to imagine any other flow. So studying machine learning in, in academia, you can do it to some extent, but still you need to train something 24 seven to get used to it. And if you're thinking about machine learning and applications to industry deployment and some real time requirements, maybe you know embedded devices or maybe stop driving cars, Again, pretty hard for me to imagine that you will do this in your free time. You need to do it at work to understand what's actual limitations here and there. Basically, machine learning is not physics. Studying it's significantly easy, and you can do it by yourself, even if you're still in the high school and you don't know all this like crazy math. Right. Uh, so if someone was getting started with machine learning today, how should they get started with it? Uh, so for this question, I typically answer, you just go to Kaggle and try to participate in these competitions, any competition that is the soonest you jump into it, copy someone's code, try to understand it, make a submission, read about it, in some hackish and efficient way, maybe your code quality is bad, maybe something is not cool, but you need to try to climb on this leaderboard higher, higher and higher, and your knowledge will come slowly, you will like see the pipelines that you're building for different competitions, they remind itself, you try to make them more general, and this may boost your software engineering skill. Also, you will like understand like, so you see you're competing at Kaggle against people that know how to do machine learning in practice, and they understand theory, and they understand what and how all these parameters work. So for you to get to the top, you also need to get to the stage. So in the beginning, you'll start blindly without thinking, without knowing what exactly are you doing. But then you will pick up, you will read, you will ask, you will interact. You have this like a lot of these aha moments. YouTube videos where people cover solutions to previous competitions are very valuable. You read some again, like I mentioned, papers, but also what's important, maybe like watching videos from the papers. If you're in academia, you go to the conference, you talk to people, ask questions. Basically, I mean, if you have this like goal to optimize this metric in terms of getting higher the reading board, knowledge will come. There is no way to avoid it. I see. So I believe if like you have no clue what's happening or it doesn't matter your background, machine learning competitions worked for me relatively well. It worked relatively well for a few of my friends. And I believe it's a relatively general way to to get into this area. Right. And how long did it take you to go from uh, zero experience in Kaggle to being a grandmaster? Uh, this is a good question. So when I, I started, I, I believe like five years ago, my first three competitions were epic fails. I did everything right, everything following textbooks, and it didn't give me good results. But after every competition, I read solutions of the winners, learned their tricks, like understood what am I missing, how to work with data better, what tools they were using that I was missing. And after a third competition, I got what is called a kind of silver medal. Basically, it's like if you get in top 50 out of whatever thousand, I don't know, you get silver medal. So I got in top 50. And after this, it took me another year and a half to get a gold medal. Gold medal is something that you get in the top 10 places. And when you get this gold medal, you get like title of Kaggle Master. I don't know, like, like 3,000 Kaggle Masters in the world right now. So it's not that rare, but actually not that common. To become a Kaggle Grandmaster, you need to have five gold medals, and one of them should be solo. I mean, no team by yourself. And it took me probably like another year or two. Like Grandmaster, it's about 200 right now in the world, so it's relatively like challenging task. But at the same time, as I mentioned, it opens a lot of doors to you because if people want to invite some software engineer from Lyft, it's one story. If they want to invite, so like for the conference to give a talk, if like it's software engineer who's Kaggle Grandmaster, you get extra credibility and you know i'll be keynote speaker in some small conference next week and i'm also giving a talk in a month so it kind of helps nice so it took you about like two years total then 
uh, the, you know, maybe three years. Yeah. I know some people they were able to become grandmasters in one year, but it's a tight timeline because I mean, boosting from scratch or from nothing to this like top knowledge in this competitive machine learning world, it's challenging. So, and again, we have three million people registered at Kaggle, and only two hundred of them are grandmasters. So not everyone is probably capable of this or not, doesn't have enough time or motivation. Or... Basically, I wouldn't say that if someone will invest like two, year, two or three years of his time into machine learning competitions, he will become or he or she will become grandmaster. It may be a strong statement. I'm assuming many people tried, but not anyone was able to do it. Right. Uh, you say you worked on more than 70 competitions, right? I think so. I mean, work doesn't mean that I worked really hard. Maybe like 20 or 30 of them, I really invested time and tried to fight for like winning at top places. But others, I may work with the data, do a few submissions, iterate a few times, and then I may, like lose interest or something happened there. And it's not only at Kaggle. Kaggle may be 60, but I also, at some point of my life, I realized that Kaggle competitions are hard. You get like top sportsmen if you want mm, money involved like real time with your both thousands of participants and this is hard at the same time people in industry they don't know what is kaggle how challenging it is and they didn't care that much right now situation is slightly different but two years ago it was the case people didn't know that kaggle exists uh, things like this at the same time many people in like in the industry they knew about cvpr or mikai or new rips or some other conferences and all this conference, they also host competitions. And typically, a level of these competitions is drastically easier. You take some, I had this experience, again, I shared this in the blog post. You come to some conference, you do some baselines. Things that are considered baselines in Kaggle, they may be considered state of the art at these conferences. And I had this experience at CDPR and Mekai. You get to the top, and then you add this to your resume, and instantly HRs are very excited because they see some common keyword that they were instructed to see. So at some point, I switched from Kaggle to academia competitions. So I participated in medical imaging and like satellite imagery, CDPR, Mekai, and then to wrap it up with more, I published papers based on solutions that I and my teammates had. You published papers on those solutions? Yeah, apparently it was a surprise for me, but every solution that you have from this competition, you can wrap as a tech report or as an academic paper. And it, if it's well written, if problem is clear, solution is clear, and basically normal report about work that you did, tricks that you used and what worked, what doesn't, it easily accepted to the different conferences, maybe not new ribs, but still I had this experience with CPR workshops Mikai workshops, um, ECML, I think it was ECML, ICCV. Yeah, so in this sense, these competitions helped me on one side boost my skills, boost my personal brand. I got like some money, it was like total and price money was probably less than 50,000, but still it's something. And of course, also because I published these papers, it helped my like, community to understand what exactly my team and I were doing in these problems. And for me, again, to boost also my Google Scholar, and maybe if at some point I will decide to go back to academia, it may be beneficial. Right. Do you think that was helpful for getting your job at Lyft too? Uh, not really. I realized that, so I, I had this belief that, that material from the competitions you cannot publish as a paper. And I didn't do this. I realized that it, it's doable only when I joined Lyft. And that's why if you look at my Google Scholar, most of my publication citations that come in the last two and a half years. So I didn't really check how it will benefit right now. At the same time, if I will look for a new position right now, and I have lift self-driving, deep learning in my resume, this, this is strong reliant than Kaggle and competitions. And it means that I, I hope that if, when I look for my next positions, my resume will be thick enough to open doors that I'm interested in. Right. Uh, so in this article, you know, like we were talking about, you explained how you went from your debt collection uh, mm -hmm. machine learning job to you know your Java lifts. Uh, so could you maybe explain what that journey was like in case people haven't read the article? Uh, so I was working debt collection agency. I was doing traditional machine learning. I was building recommender systems. I didn't have extended knowledge in computer vision. 
and deep learning, I didn't have any lines in my resume that I did work on any like relevant projects in academia, and I didn't have any lines in resume that I had something similar in at my current position. Uh, but still, so I wanted to move to this industry, and when I believe everyone is in similar positions, you just like write your resume, you send it around, you go to the job interviews, and you like fail, you run, you repeat them, you learn problems that you are facing and you're not comfortable with. For example, I was in an interview with NVIDIA and I wasn't comfortable with 2D object detectors. And so I participated in competition for 2D object detectors. I spent two months on this. I got some prize money. And, you know, during this time, I became extremely comfortable in the topic that was state of the art at the time and its limitations for production, limitations in industry, and new names of all best papers at a time. And basically, yeah, that's how I closed the gap in that knowledge. Then at some other interview, I may have some problems with more, you know, software engineering practices. And, you know, after this interview pointed me out for these like mistakes and errors that I made, I focused on this area. So, and then I repeated this number of times. And at some point, about eight months later, so it took me about eight months to get from this original point to getting offer from Lyft. Mm, I studied a lot, I participated in a lot of machine learning, deep learning, computer vision competitions. Mm, yeah, failed, I don't know, like probably I applied to more than 100 companies. Out of the big companies, I failed interview with Facebook, LinkedIn, Tesla, mm, what other big companies have, and plenty of other, like, you know, middle and small startups. And finally, got to lift. Wow. Um... I'm kind of curious, how do you think you were able to, you know, motivate yourself so much during this time? Uh, in this sense, motivation at the time was significantly easier. Let's say right now, if I would like to motivate myself to work on competitions, it would be challenging. I have interesting projects at work, and I have like other activities to do, so I'm in a good position. At the same time, you see, I work in debt collection agency, and I didn't like my job. It was okay, but I wanted to move to some other place. And, you know, if you have some burning urge to get outside of the place that you are, you're pretty motivated to spend your weekends and evenings on some extra activities. They may help you achieve your goal. Makes sense. So you spend a lot of time on these competitions then? It, it, competitions is a second unpaid full-time job. So realistically, during the day, I was working and trying to bring value to the company. And then in the evenings and weekends, I was spending full time on like, these competitions. And to be more efficient, you know, my hardware was optimized, I learned good like practices for working with the data, I had fast SSD, fast GPUs, and yeah, basically right. try to be as efficient as possible in terms of iteration speed, in terms of ideas that I was checking. And I even remember in public transportation, like all people are listening to music, I was reading papers. Wow. So even this time I tried to leverage for better efficiency. Right. And what was your hardware and software uh, setup at that time? Uh, so I started with some, I don't know, six thread or like 12 thread CPU, 32 GB RAM, and I had one Titan with 12 GB RAM. Then somewhere in spring of 2017, and my friend and I, we finished third in Kaggle DSTL competition, and we got $20,000 in prizes. So from that money, 10,000 will mine. After you pay taxes, let's say you get about 6,000. So I spent this 6,000 and I bought another computer that had four GPUs, 1080 Ti, 64 GB RAM. I mean, some extended hard, like, you know, hard disks. And it's still my computer till this time that I'm using for calculations for some side projects or competitions or whatever I do at home. Uh, which computer is it? So one with the four 1080 Ti's. Four, sorry, what? So like, well, after I finished like third in the steel competition, I got prize mm -hmm. money. And so I took this prize money and I got bought computer with four GPUs. Yeah? Four GPUs, yeah. right. Yeah, I mean, I'm just kind of curious about it because I might need to, you know, uh, get like a laptop or computer with GPUs at some point too. Uh, I don't know that like, you know, that lap laptop with GPUs may be a good idea for some use cases, but I can't really find it because you can't train anything on this like laptop with GPUs. You still need like access to the cloud or some external server or desktop. 
Right. So, do you do, yeah. yeah. Sorry, go ahead. But for your computations, I would say, let's say at work, I have desktop with, of course I have laptop at work, like because meetings and other stuff. But I also have desktop with two GPUs and it's good enough for me for prototyping, for doing some fast iterations. And again, when I need something heavy, it just goes and calculate it in the cloud. And I see. Many people like follow similar approach. I see. That's, is that what you did for competitions too? Uh, no, for competitions, the cloud is expensive. Mm -hmm. And if you're training for 20, so if you like train something occasionally, cloud is a good idea. But if you're training something 24 seven, having your own computer is much better. That's why I bought this. I had this one computer with one GPU, and then I bought another computer with four GPUs. Nice. So one for prototyping, and second for heavy lifting, like standing and you know calculating something for days and weeks. Right, makes sense. Uh, you switched from Keras to PyTorch, right? This is true. Yes. So I was I was using Keras for a while. So originally I tried deep learning with Cafe. It worked in some sense, but it was relatively painful. Then I switched to Theana. Theana was better than Cafe, but still kind of painful. Then Francois released Keras that was wrapper, high level wrapper over Theana, and Keras was really useful, was convenient, and I was using it for a while. The problem with Keras was that at the time it didn't work well with multiple GPUs. Utilization was much lower than for PyTorch, and also data loader is not that good. Plenty of other limitations. Debugging of the PyTorch significantly easier. Uh, I've seen today some tweet that OpenAI fully switched to PyTorch. I know that NVIDIA research also like only using PyTorch in their research. There are definitely reasons for fast prototyping, efficient GPU utilization, and many advantages that modern PyTorch provides. That's why I shifted from Keras to PyTorch. For one GPU, it's maybe not that important, but for multiple GPU setup, PyTorch is at a time. Right now, I hope Keras picked up, but at the time, it's significantly better. I see. What do you use uh, work? Uh, at work, it really depends. I don't think that I can talk about this in public, but we use different frameworks depending on the task. I see. Uh, is there anything from work that you can talk about? Uh, I prefer not to talk about work. You see, we have pretty strict policy. I need to get a for every conference that I give a talk on the behalf of Lyft, I need approval from marketing, legal, and some management, relatively challenging task. So I all about stuff that's available online. Let's say this fall, Lyft was hosting competition at Kaggle, and I was its host. I can like maybe like talk a bit more about this because we gave presentation at New Rips, and right now we're preparing blog posts that maybe share even more results, how it looked from our sides and what lesson we learned in the world. Sure, I think that'll be great. So yeah, competitions can provide a lot of value to the companies if they, with a few like limitations, if you want. So first of all, I know about zero examples when winning solution from the competition went to production. Typically, all competitions companies provide to get new ideas to understand what are the limitations of the existing data set, how much, like, how much can you get out of it. Again, like new ideas, new approaches, maybe analysis of what are the current research because participants take some recent papers, they apply and they like report what works, what doesn't. This is also extremely valuable. Solutions that you get at the result, they don't directly go to production. But if there is a person in the team in a company who was participant in this competition or maybe experienced in some other competitions, he or she may be able to extract like all necessary value from the provided code that winners give you and adapt this to the production limitations. In this sense, we were lucky because I was this person. So I was host of the competition and I was interviewing winners and I was like helping the community during the competition. And so we got the winning solutions, I analyze them, and I'm in the process in terms of like extracting value out of them and making them part of our like production pipelines. So yeah, we did this, but one of the reasons, like one of the main reasons why we probably did this competition is not because we wanted to extract some value for our production pipelines. We can do it ourselves. But story is slightly different. So if I, when I come to the conferences, New Reaps or CBPR or something else, there are plenty of papers that say we like self-driving, autonomous and things like this and their like names. And of course, people use it 
like for high values because I mean if you have some like, cool name chances that you'll get accepted are higher or maybe if you like show some relevance to some hot topic which cell driving is at the same time when you read the content of this paper or you're trying to understand what problems they're trying to face to solve for 99 percent of them maybe 90 percent of them problems that they're trying to solve are orthogonal to what industry is trying to solve like really orthogonal so people like write what is publishable and not what was really useful one of the reasons for this is that data sets that we use in self-driving cars and when i say we i mean how the whole industry like uber lyft Waymo, Aptive, yandex other companies they are combined from like lidar and radar and cameras and they happen in 3d and these types of the data set are not that well established not that well not that many of them the most is prominent and most well-known data set is kitty and till this moment till last year all research was based on it but in last year aptive linked Waymo and rdi i believe they released their own data sets that combine lidar and camera that like some time evolution and this is cool so when you release data set you write a blog post okay we release data set blog post but what happens after this nothing happens people like instantly may forget because a lot of information in the internet to promote your data set to make it a more established to attract research in you know industrial community I mean, people often organize competitions image you remember image net was game changing competition some other competitions like coca and you know, many others basically you have data set, you make competition on top of this, you may attract some critical mass of people that will build something on top of this, publish papers, blog posts, basically some motion around this. So in many ways, this competition that we organized followed the same path. We released this data set and we wanted people to get more used to it, maybe share some code base, develop some pipelines, some ideas, understand it's like, you know, not too easy or maybe like not too hard, basically this data set from being something like extreme and exotic, this type of the problem being like more commodity. And we organized this competition. Winner, so like it was going for two months, we got pretty interesting solutions. Winners shared their descriptions at the Kaggle forum. Some of them shared their code. So I hope, I mean, I, in this sense, we in Lift Hope, then when Wayne or someone else organized similar competition of their data, for like people that are new to the area, even for experienced people, it will be significantly easier to jump in because they'll be able to get some knowledge and maybe some code from something that participants developed in ours. So we believe this competition went pretty well. We had more than 500 teams, I don't know, 600 participants. Most likely for the next competition, we'll put more restrictions on the inference time and on the hardware to make it more closer to our production setting. And it may happen that it will go like for a bit longer because two months for this type of the data set, I believe, is not enough. Like four months would be like slightly better. Yeah. What was the data set like? Uh, so it's like LiDAR point cloud. Imagine, like, you know, we had like our real lift cars, they're driving around. Each car, I don't know, has three lighters, has six cameras pointing in all directions. We collect this data as a function of time. And so you get this point cloud, camera, and all it's like synchronized so that you can map camera to LiDAR, LiDAR to camera. And then for this type of the task, we had 3D object detection. So participants were asked to find 3D bounding boxes around cars, animals, emergency vehicles, pedestrians, and other classes. I see. Um, so you're a computer vision engineer, right? Yeah, that's correct. OK. Um, so since you can't talk about like your work specifically, could you maybe talk about how you got into computer vision in the first place? I told you like Kaggle competitions were the way to go. So right now, what I see sometimes people call this like right now, golden gauge of natural language processing. But three years ago, when I like was getting into this area, computer vision started moving from academia to industry and computer vision applications, like classification, object detection, and semantic segmentation, more and more companies started using them to extract value from the data that they have. In this sense, and it means that Kaggle picked the trend, more and more of this type of the competitions were happening there and other platforms. A lot of research was in this area. In this sense, I was just like following the trend. And of course, like more tutorial, blog posts, different libraries, that's why 
in the field of the deep learning, which is pretty broad, I jumped to the computer vision because, I mean, it's exciting area by itself, and also it was easy to pick up at that moment of time. I see. So you were you got interested in uh, computer vision, and then you started finding related competitions, and you just started working on those? Yeah, exactly. Right. You make it sound like really simple to get into it. I wouldn't say simple, it's straightforward. Mm -hmm. I right. believe everyone can follow the same path, but as usual, for some people it may work a bit better, and they'll get like hooked. For some people, it may not work well, and they will try some reasons, excuses, so some different priorities, mm -hmm. so that they will not work on this type of the tasks. Right. But again, I believe for those that are right now in some type of the job and they want to move to computer vision related position, the best approach would be probably similar to what I did. Send your resumes, because again, if you get your job fast, you don't need these competitions. Mm -hmm. But if it's, you know, if you fail, if people don't look at your resume, or you don't have enough knowledge, or something else is happening, you can probably just start participating. And again, Kaggle or other machine learning competitions gives you about 10 to 100x knowledge per unit of time with respect to academia and industry. It's extremely efficient environment. Stressful but efficient, right? For learning, stressful in what ways? So Kaggle has some gamification mechanisms that you know, this like Kaggle Master, Grand Master, some Kaggle points. They have this like real time leaderboard, and so if you get hooked in this competition, you're participating, and then let's say you go to sleep, you come in the morning, and you're twenty places like you know below, and in the morning you should like focus I don't know on the breakfast on you so your job or something like this but instead like your brain conscious and unconscious thinking okay like i lost 20 places per night like i mean i need to like to get back and then you generate some ideas you get this like into this multitasking mode then in the evening instead of i don't know like going doing sports or something like this you get excited and like focus you like get some ideas you improve with some papers something works something doesn't and you get back your 20 places you get a lot of knowledge but your day wasn't very relaxed and then in the morning you wake up again and you gain 20 places slower because like everyone in this leaderboard is doing exactly the same. Mm -hmm. And now you need to repeat this procedure. So you're in, in this constant, there's like constant social and some other pressure for you to, to study, to boost. In right. some things it makes you less sleepy for sure. Somehow you get more energy and you're more excited and maybe some endorphins and dopamines and other hormones that are boosting you. But it's definitely stress. Right. It's almost like a game then. Uh, maybe not a game. I would say, like, think about sport, mm. competitive sport. Right. So yeah, it's like, you know, in, in some computer games, people have some sports with like it's some real drama and who is winning, who is losing. You know, some real sports, there's a lot of drama. And in computer games, sports, you know, championships, there's a lot of drama. Think about this Kaggle, maybe not drama, but there is definitely like similar things. Right. So okay, yeah. well, machine learning competitions, yeah, are similar to sports in some senses. I see. Um, so you said that computer vision was, you know, becoming more important in 2017. Yeah, definitely. Right. And you also said that uh, natural language processing is becoming uh, more important today. So let's say even two years ago, when you have some natural language processing problem, for most of them, you don't need deep learning. You take some TF-IDF, SVM on top of this, and you get pretty good solutions. And when people try to apply some complex deep learning pipelines, they were on par with traditional machine learning on top of this. But in the last like year or two, there was like pretty like many of important breakthroughs. This BERT, GPT-2, basically neural networks are working really well and so it boosted chatbots it boosted many other natural language processing related tasks so this field is still growing computer vision i wouldn't say stagnating it's like you know saturating maturing and so more and more applications it's in the stage where more and more things is going into production more startups are built on this and yeah not that so there are plenty of startups that build on top of computer vision technology but I don't know any successful startup that's built on top of natural language processing technology because technology is not mature enough for this in productionizing this industrial stage. But 
right now, situation is changing, technology is getting better. So two years ago, chatbots were like, you know, maybe not a fraud, but definitely not the best like investment in that direction. So if two years ago, someone from Vladimir, like we have this great product, chatbots come work, work with us, I would say good luck with your life, guys, like I won't go there. But right now, story may be different. And natural language processing, a lot of like great results, a lot of breakthroughs in terms of like network, in terms of data, in terms of all the separations. So this field looks very promising at the moment. I see. Do you think you want to stay in computer vision or going to somewhere something well, else eventually? I would say, yeah, like two, three years ago, I really wanted to be in computer vision, deep learning. Right now, I got some kind of satisfaction from this. I understand how all this works. I understand how cell driving technology works. I understand how to apply computer vision to medical imaging and any other type of imaging. Of course, like you can study and learn new things here indefinitely, but I'm pretty good with this. So it may happen that at some point I will shift to slightly different domain. Nice. Um, okay, I think I have one last question, which is what I always ask. Okay. Um, is there anything else that you want to add to this conversation? Uh, I don't know. So I really like that you and other people told me that my like blog post was motivational. Mm, so I would like also this interview to have similar flavors to motivate people to study. Uh, we are talking about machine learning, deep learning, computer vision. As I've said, I talk to my software engineering friends and they say, oh my God, like I would prefer to do software engineering. I would like to do machine learning, but it's so complex. All this math, you need to have PhD. No guys, machine learning these days, you can get like out of the high school and like do a lot of cool stuff. You'd like, first of all, math and machine learning is not very advanced. People think it's advanced, no, with respect to physics, it's just like at most first year of the freshman year. So math is not that hard. And also with the current tutorials and everything, getting there is easy. So if you're thinking or considering about going to machine learning field, just start doing something. Machine learning competitions is a great way to jump in, but the project something and don't postpone it for like later. Later typically means never. Just try to do it now and hopefully you will like it and find a job in this field and yeah, life will be good. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much, Vlad. Thank you.